So in this video, I'll be showing you how to do the technique for femoral hernia assessment. We'll just do one side at a time. So we're scanning a 21 year old male who's consented to this video. Uh, the first thing to do is to train the patient how to push properly. We have their arms resting on the chest. You don't want the arms stretched up over the head. Anything that will engage the abdominal muscles is going to mask a hernia. Then we place the probe on the groin crease. So in transverse, just below the pubic symphysis or tubercle, we can see the inguinal ligament and vein and artery. We can turn in longitudinal and identify the pelvic rim, the bone in the background, the common femoral vein, and ideally we want to find the saphenofemoral junction. So when we ask the patient to strain, the probe needs to be positioned medial to that common femoral vein where the femoral canal is. If a hernia extends down to the level of the SFJ, then it's probably a significant or clinically significant hernia. These are the landmarks. Inguinal ligament, we're looking deep to the ligament. We want to see something extend down below the pelvic brim. So here's the steps. In transverse, find the iliacus, the femoral artery and the, the femoral head on the groin crease. Turn into longitudinal. If you're too lateral, you see iliopsoas. We're moving past the femoral vessels and we land on the femoral canal. We're looking at this location here, superficial to the pectineus muscle. Now let's explore a few inguinal canal strategies. This is where a lot of people get hung up on the anatomy. We can do a little plonk on the abdomen and run down and identify the pubic symphysis. I think this is a great place to start for all learning sonographers. Then as we slide laterally, you can see the bone drop off at a little angle. That's where the inguinal ligament inserts. It's also where the conjoint tendon inserts. And with the probe in trans, immediately superolateral is our spermatic cord or what we know as the superficial or external ring. Both types of hernia can exit here. We can ask the patient to strain, but remember you need to take the pressure off the probe to allow the hernia out. So you can see something's moving, but at this point we still don't know if it's direct or indirect. So I'm gonna cover a few steps or strategies that you can employ to identify all your landmarks. Running down in longitudinal, on the rectus abdominis or the pyramidalis muscle there, we follow our peritoneum and pyramidalis and we arrive at the pubic tubercle. You move slightly laterally and identify veins in the spermatic cord. This is the superficial ring. Now what we're gonna do is rotate the top of the camera slightly obliquely to point towards the ASIS, meaning we're aligning with the inguinal ligament. Now what you see is almost like an equal sign, two echogenic white lines running either side of the spermatic cord. So we follow those slightly supralaterally. You only need to slide the transducer maybe a centimeter further on. We've got an intact posterior wall of the inguinal canal and we're identifying where the veins wanna drop into the abdomen. So where those veins drop into the abdomen, that's the deep ring. Now we need to lay the camera flatten as if you're coming in from a lateral approach Still try and find that little inferior epigastric vessel. We find the deep ring with the patient relaxed and then we get them to strain. And we're looking between that little triangle, which is the remnant of the internal oblique abdominus muscle. We're looking beneath that as they strain, taking the pressure off the probe. And you can see something sliding, but we've got to be really careful that it's not just the somatic cord sliding. So a true hernia will either contain fat, fluid or bowel. You can see we don't have a bowel pattern here. We can't see veins. So it's probably not the spermatic cord. It's probably likely a little hernia. So you can see it's using the deep ring. I find it really helpful now to compress and take a little video loop as you're pushing that contents back into the abdomen. And we can see clearly something compressed into the abdomen and this is the deep ring now measured with compression or once once the hernia has been re reduced so the inferior epigastric artery and your internal oblique forming that little muscular triangle are the two most characteristic anatomic landmarks around the deep ring 
And this deep ring is the entrance to the inguinal canal. So if something's coming through this location, we know that it's an indirect hernia. It's obeying the rules of the abdomen. It's using the, the door, if you like, of the inguinal canal and traveling through the inguinal canal with the spermatic cord in a male or in the female, the round ligament and associated veins. So we need to do it a few times. It's very easy for the probe to slip off medial or lateral and for you to miss this. You can assess it in transverse, but transverse can be even more confusing. So I think the, the ideal thing is you look and see, is the hernia traveling left to right across the screen between its roof and the transversalis fascia and peritoneum? So let's run over those steps. So we run down the rectus abdominis, we find the pubic tubercle. We're going to move maybe five millimeters lateral, taking the pressure off to try and find a little opening in that echogenic aponeurosis to the left. Here it is, we can see a little opening with some veins. This is our spermatic cord and the superficial ring. Now we're going to rotate the probe into oblique, identify the posterior wall of the canal and follow those veins, pampuniform veins, up past the little epigastric vessel, looking for the triangular internal oblique and now that we've seen those parallel white lines, we can compress and just see what happens to those contents. We can see them slip back into the abdomen, which is not typical of a spermatic cord. It's got to be that there's a little hernial sac. Now, following that echogenic line there, that's the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. That's where your direct hernias can bust out. So in turning into transverse, identifying the spermatic cord, identifying the posterior wall, and then moving the probe slightly superiorly, we keep our eye on the deep side of the spermatic cord. Now we're asking the patient to strain. Ignoring the movement to the left, we can see a bulge has occurred. This is in the region of Hasselbach's triangle, but we expect intra-abdominal pressure to increase and cause, of course, your abdominal wall layers to bulge out. <clears throat> so in this location here, we see peritoneum, and we can see in behind the rectus abdominis, our peritoneum transversalis fascia. So turning back into longitudinal, once we identify that layer there, we can then move our probe laterally. We can see rectus abdominis disappearing. We see conjoint tendon over the top and we ask our patient to strain. So naturally we're seeing peritoneal bulge and the conjoint tendon sometimes bows up towards the camera, but that in itself is not a hernia. Any more laterally and we land back onto our inguinal canal posterior wall. We check this area as well for a hernia that can mushroom up through that floor. So that posterior wall is staying intact despite the patient pushing. We can just see the little indirect hernia sliding left to right across the screen. Whereas our direct hernias tend to bust up towards the transducer vertically, a bit like an atomic bomb. Now we'll have a look at the left groin and follow some of those steps again. So if you find the rectus abdominis, run it down to the pubic symphysis. There's the pubic tubercle. We can see little pyramidalis muscle above, there's spermatic cord. Now we take the pressure off, but ideally we turn into longitudinal, find the pubic tubercle and just slip slightly laterally until the muscle disappears, rectus abdominis disappears, and we just see a little thin white line which represents the conjoint tendon. And a little more laterally, we see veins. We've now fallen onto the spermatic cord and the pampiniform veins and the superficial ring. Now we've rotated slightly obliquely to lengthen those veins out across the screen. And we're identifying those two parallel white lines which is the roof and the posterior wall. We're asking the patient to strain. So we can see naturally the veins within the spermatic cord want to slide to the south and slide back up north when the patient relaxes. That's normal spermatic cord movement. But if we track the veins up to the deep ring, we see the veins just droop or drop into the abdomen. That's our deep ring. And at the deep ring, we should be able to see our inferior epigastric artery just at the back wall, there it is there, and a little triangular 
muscle over the top, which is internal oblique. So this is just identifying the deep ring on a relaxed view. Remembering if a hernia comes through here, it's an indirect hernia. So in a male, we're expecting that to be up to 10 millimeters is quite normal because of all the contents that have to be allowed through. But we can see with a gradual strain, that gap is widening. So we're widening beyond 10 millimeters. There's some intra-abdominal peritoneal or omental fat protruding into the deep ring. It may only partially protrude, uh, protrude which makes it a partial hernia, and it easily compresses back with probe pressure. So one of the pitfalls is you can push too hard and hold it in. You've got to be very light-handed. It's like you put the weight on the bottom of the camera, but the top end of the camera has to almost lift off the patient's skin. We're going to measure that deep ring. That's always going to be reported as the neck of the hernia. That size is important to, for the surgeon to pick the right size mesh or the right type of surgery. Direct hernias, on the other hand, are usually massive, not that small. So now we're checking the posterior wall of the inguinal canal to see if a direct hernia comes up through here, in which case the defect's usually a lot larger. So we ask the patient to strain. Doing this in longitudinal is uh, technically difficult, but also may you may run the risk of missing a hernia that's occurring medial to where your transducer is. So while we've done that, we haven't completely excluded a direct hernia. So if you run down again, find your landmarks and just move lateral to the rectus abdominis, just a little bit lateral to the conjoint tendon, do the same thing again. So we can see in longitudinal, there's a bulge, but nothing is actually uh, herniating below the level of the pubic tubercle or pubic symphysis. Not all hernias have to protrude below, but you're looking for a defect in that conjoint tendon or a defect in the posterior wall behind the inguinal um, canal. The transverse assessment of this whole region, medial to spermatic cord, is a really thorough technique to make sure you don't miss a direct hernia. So what we've done is just trace the spermatic cord from its external ring back up to the deep ring. And then we sit down at the superficial ring, looking for anything bulging up through that region of Hasselbach's triangle, rectus abdominis is to the left, spermatic cord to the right. So even though spermatic cord sort of gets displaced and you can see a bulge, this is completely normal. There's no direct hernia. So you're running from inferior to superior, looking at this layer here, looking for a defect. And we've arrived up at the deep ring without seeing a defect medial. So we know there's no direct hernia. So back into longitudinal now. We can see the deep ring to the left. We can see something sliding from left to right across the screen. That makes this an indirect hernia because it's using the deep ring as its entrance point. So normally that deep ring should have obliterated in a young male by birth or by two years of age. If it stays open, we call that a congenital hernia, meaning they didn't acquire the hernia through life. The direct hernias that bust through this region here are more likely acquired through um, work or through physical activity. <laughs> so running down that rectus abdominis, as you move slightly lateral, you'll see the conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon is just a thin white ligamentous thing. Step three is always you find the spermatic cord, follow the veins up, step four, where they dive into the abdomen, that's the deep ring. So you can see at this point, we are, can ask the patient to strain because we're confident that we've arrived at the deep ring. We can see the veins and our landmarks. <coughs> and then if you don't find hernia, you can quickly scout the anterior hip for any other causes of pain. Um, in this case, Really laterally, we can find the rectus uh, femoris origin. We can look at the anterior hip joint and labrum, and then sometimes you'll pick up labral cysts and hip effusions. So that's a really thorough and complete uh, assessment for athletic pubalgia or for groin pain. 
and uh, hopefully that was helpful. Thanks for watching.